it is my great pleasure to introduce Professor Pat Winston. Uh, he's such an inspiring scientist to many of us. Um, after a PhD at MIT and a postdoc with Gerald Finch, he started his lab at Harvard Medical School. Um, and we're actually lucky to have him participate in our mentoring program. And we had in our sign-up sheet, like people fill out their years of experience at the current stage. And his very matter-of-factly said 37 years, um, which increased the mean by quite a bit. Um, so I won't even try to, to cover everything he's done at that time, but Fred has made really seminal contributions to our understanding of gene regulation. Uh, perhaps most famous is his screen for suppressors of thigh elements, which identified so many core members of the transcriptional machinery, the SPT genes. Um, and through his work, we've learned a lot about these different factors, and in recent years, particularly about SPT6. His many honors include being an elected member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the National Academy of Sciences, um, and giving the Lee Hartwell Lecture at the Yeast Genetics Meeting, for example. So I won't list all the other ones, uh, but I'll just hand over uh, to Fred so we can all just enjoy uh, this beautiful science. It's our pleasure to host you. Thank you so much for, for speaking today, and please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Hanukkah, for that nice introduction. So today, I'm going to talk about our studies on transcription and chromatin structure. And uh, this first slide is just to remind everybody that um, our favorite organism is yeast, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. But everything that I'm going to talk about is conserved in all of these other organisms shown at the bottom. So as everybody knows, when transcription uh, goes occurs on a chromatin template and RNA polymerase is moving down the template, it doesn't move by itself, of course moves with a huge number of other factors. And this slide shows just a subset of those factors. And they are associated dynamically, they come and they go. But interestingly, while there's a lot that's known about some of them, many of them are still mysterious in what they do. And so a big challenge to the field is to try to understand how all these factors work in a coordinated way to enable transcription elongation. Several of the factors are histone chaperones, and those are shown in yellow on this slide, but I want to introduce you to histone chaperones, and that introduction is shown next. So histone chaperones uh, help overcome the barriers that nucleosomes create during transcription. Nucleosomes, of course, need to be displaced, modified, reassembled during anything that a polymerase does during transcription, during DNA replication, and during DNA repair. And histone chaperones all, in some way, bind to histones and facilitate these processes. But the question for us is, why are there so many histone chaperones needed during transcription? So our focus has been on three essential histone chaperones, one of which Hanukkah mentioned, SPT6, and another one, SPIN1, and another one, FACT, and I'll be talking about those today. So a little bit of background. These have been studied since the last century. Uh, a little bit of background about all of these Histone chaperones, as I said, they all interact uh, uh, with histones directly. They all co-localize with transcribing RNA polymerase II, although interestingly, only SPT6 has been shown to directly interact with RNA polymerase II. SPT6 and SPIN1 directly interact with each other, but they have distinct functions, and I'll talk about that in a minute. FACT, on the other hand, is a heterodimer, and those two subunits are thought to contribute to a common function, although there is some evidence in the literature that they might do distinct functions as well. And among these three, even though each one is essential for viability and there's a lot of evidence that they have distinct functions, they are all functionally related by a huge amount of genetic and uh, other data that say that they somehow are aware of what each other are doing. And so that's what we're trying to address. So what I'm going to talk about today is uh, briefly review what we've seen in the last couple of years for the roles for SPT6 and SPIN1, and then uh, address what is the function? Why do these two histone chaperones interact with each other? And what have we learned by exploring that? And then our progress report on how genetics has connected fact to that issue. So the people that did the work are shown here. Uh, most of the new work I'm going to talk about today was headed by a postdoc in the lab, Olga Viktorovskaya, with computational analysis done by a former grad student, James Chung, and Deval Jane, who was a postdoc in Peter Park's lab. And I'll be talking about work of everybody else, Steve Doris, Francesca Lopez-Rivera, Natalia Reem, Katie Weiner, and Dan Spatt, 
as I go along. And in addition to Peter's lab, we had very productive collaboration with Sterling Churchman's lab. So let me start by giving a, just a recap, brief recap, about what we know about the role of SPT6. And that's shown on the next slide. So we studied SPT6 by depleting the protein, as shown up here on the left. And we did this using a temperature-sensitive allele, SPT6-1004. And here's a Western just showing the degree of depletion after we've shifted cells to 37 degrees. And when we analyzed transcription after that depletion, we defined the effects over four classes of promoters. Genic, which we all know and love. Intragenic, meaning transcription on the sense strand starting within the open reading frame. Antisense, also intergenic, but on the antisense strand, and intergenic transcription. And the results are shown in this plot down here on the bottom with wild type in blue. And if we look at wild type first, we see exactly what we would expect. With genic promoters, the predominant class that are transcribed, and uh, all the others are lower. And I should mention this is all done by a method that I'm not going to describe, TSS-seq, that measures mRNA 5 prime ends quantitatively at single nucleotide level. When we deplete SPT6, we see fairly drastic result where uh, genic promoters are largely down and intragenic antisense and intergenic are now at a level where it's about even across the board. So we see a drastic change now with thousands of intragenic and antisense promoters activated that were not activated before. We also looked at chromatin structure and that's summarized up here. This is an MNA-seq experiment. Wild type is in blue, and we see exactly what we would expect with uh, position nucleosomes plus 1, plus 2, plus 3, and so on. However, after SPT6 depletion, again, we see a drastic effect where we see a loss of nucleosomes and fuzzier nucleosomes. So positioning is not as great either. So to summarize what we saw for SPT6 depletion, uh, we learned that in a eukaryotic genome, many sequences are able to serve as promoters. In normal cells, we see uh, what we call genic promoters activating and many others. But SPT6 is one of the factors that plays a huge role in regulating which promoters are used. And I uh, don't have time to talk about the possible role of intragenic promoters or why an elongation factor affects uh, genic promoters, but I'd be happy to discuss that later. This work was all done from this paper, Doris et al., um, but many other labs, including the Nislau lab, Bentley lab, and Robert lab, have all um, contributed to this work, to our understanding of this work. So that's SPT6. Now I want to talk about SPIN1, which we think uh, is different than SPT6, and a summary of that is shown on the next slide. So SPIN1 was um, studied, has been studied primarily by uh, Lori Stargell and Carolyn Luger's labs, and um, a lot has been learned from their studies. We wanted to understand what happens to gene expression and chromatin structure when we deplete SPIN1, and so an example of depletion is shown here. This was done with auxin-inducible depletion, and um, when Natalia Rehm did RNA-seq, we analyzed the levels, and what we saw was that a lot of RNA levels are reduced in the mutant compared to wild type approximately 1,500, all the ones in blue, RNAs are reduced in level. When we looked at chromatin structure, rather than seeing a difference in uh, chromatin, we saw a difference in histone modifications. And here's an example of what we saw, the major effects that we saw. And this is done by ChIP-seq of um, histone modifications and of histones themselves. And this is a comparison of wild type, uh, mutant to wild type, so depleted to non-depleted. And this is a heat map where every line represents a different gene. I'm trying to find my pointer again. And uh, across. And it's all aligned by the TSS. There we are. So everywhere you see reddish, it means there's a reduced level. And everywhere you see this uh, greenish color, it's an increased level. <clears throat> so you can see that H3K4 trimethylation, for example, is shifted uh, three prime. And in addition, H3K36 trimethylation is also shifted 3 prime. This is the primary effect that we saw for a spin-1 depletion on chromatin. So a summary of what we saw for spin-1 is that um, mRNA levels are reduced. <clears throat> we think these effects are different 
than what we saw in SPT6. While we didn't measure start sites, we saw very little antisense transcription. And uh, from an early collaboration with Laurie Stargell's lab, we also saw that there was very little evidence of intragenic transcription in SPIN1 mutants. So we think that that does not occur to a great degree after losing SPIN1. But in contrast, we do see three prime shifts of histone modifications. Many of you know that this one, H3K36, is actually lost in SPT6 mutants. Here it's shifted. So the effects that we see are distinct from what we see after SPT6 depletion. And again, this is all work that was done in, uh, by Natalia Reem, James Chung, and Deval Jane, and, uh, but relied a lot on previous studies from the Stargell and Luger labs. So that's uh, SPIN1 and SPT6, but now the question is, why do these proteins interact? So we address that with the mutant, and the interaction is summarized on the next slide, and the mutant. So the regions of SPT6 and SPIN1 that interact were co-crystallized by Christoph Romier's lab and the Formosa and Hill labs at Utah. <clears throat> Based on the structures, um, Aaron Lolliger, a former student in the lab, changed two amino acids, uh, tyrosine-255 and tryptophan-257 to alanine to create an allele we call SPT6YW. And these are predicted to disrupt the interaction between SPT6 and SPIN1. And Olga looked at that and by co-IP, and those results are shown here. So in this experiment, we immunoprecipitated flag-tagged SPT6 and then asked what happens to co-immunoprecipitation of SPIN1 and RPB1, the largest subunit of RNA polymerase II. In the wild-type lane, you can see strong co-IP of both proteins. In the SPT6YW mutant, you can see that uh, SPIN1 specifically is lost from this co-IP, whereas RPB1 is not. And Olga's looked at many other proteins and shown that they're all normal. If we look at a different SPT6 allele, we see that SPIN1 co-IP is not affected. So this says that this mutant truly does abolish the interaction, or at least greatly reduce the interaction of SPT6 and SPIN1. So this mutation, which I'll be talking about a lot, SPT6YW, <clears throat> abolishes this interaction. It also causes a temperature-sensitive phenotype at 37 degrees. <clears throat> Excuse me. And both proteins are stable. So that, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> that gives us the opportunity to study what is the consequence of losing this interaction with both proteins still around. So we wanted to study this. So we took a genetic approach. We took genetic approaches by doing two mutant hunts that are summarized here. The first mutant hunt that Olga did was to take advantage of the fact that SPT6YW is temperature sensitive, and she selected for mutants that could now grow at the non-permissive temperature of 37 degrees. In a second mutant hunt, Francesca started with a strain that's deleted for spin one, kept alive by a plasmid, and then selected for suppressors that would allow viability. And when those two mutant hunts were done, they uh, both turned up mutations in a large number of other genes that overlap to a large extent. And a lot of those are factors that associate with elongating RNA polymerase. And those are shown here. So all the ones that just changed color contain mutations that suppress uh, either SPT6YW or SPIN1 deletion. And you can see that it's a large number of different uh, genes that are affected. Uh, many of these, RPD3 complex, uh, SET2, CHD1, have been found in previous mutant hunts by the Burotowski, Hartzog, and Pralik labs as suppressors of other elongation defects. But the surprising results were getting suppressors in SPT4 and SP, uh, sorry, SPT5, and in fact, and the ones I'm really going to focus on today are in fact. I should add, that from studies I'm not going to have time to tell you, that one important thing th this analysis has told us is that there are likely multiple mechanisms by which these mutations can be suppressed. But as I said, I'm really going to focus now on fact, and that's because we're very interested in it, obviously because we had never seen this type of mutation in fact before, and it was a very abundant class of suppressor, with seven mutations in SPT16 and five in POB3. So now I'm going to show you examples of suppression by one of our strongest suppressors, which is a mutation in POB3, and examples of that are shown on the next slide. 
So these are dilution spot tests, probably familiar to many of you, where we dilute uh, yeast strains and, and grow them under permissive or non-permissive conditions. On the top, we're looking at the temperature sensitive effect of wild type, the two single mutants, and then the case of POP3 mutation suppressing SPT6YW. You can see that YW causes temperature sensitive growth at 37 degrees. This is strongly suppressed uh, by the POP3 mutation. We also looked at sensitivity to DNA damaging agents. Um, I don't have time to talk about it today, but Katie Weiner in the lab has identified a lot of phenotypes for SPT6 mutants that suggest that it is defective in genome stability. This is one of them, which is sensitivity to DNA damaging agents. Again, you can see that SPT6YW causes sensitivity to fleomycin and to hydroxyurea. And again, these phenotypes are strongly suppressed by the POP3 mutation. We can also look at uh, more genomic types of phenotypes, and what the one I'm going to show you is looking at chromatin structure, and that's shown on this slide here. So we learned from um, Olga's MNA-seq experiments that SPT6YW causes a strong effect on nucleosome positioning, and that's shown here in this metagene analysis. So in black is wild type, and we see the expected pattern again for nucleosome positioning, uh, nucleosome depleted region, plus one, plus two, plus three, et cetera. In the SPT6YW mutant shown in red, we see that the level of and positioning of nucleosomes is uh, reduced. The nucleosomes are fuzzer, fuzzier, and the distance between nucleosomes has increased between, if you look at the distance between each peak. So what happens when we combine SPT6YW with the POB3 suppressor? That's shown here on the bottom. Now the double mutant is shown in blue, and you can see that the blue is almost superimposable on the black, which is wild type. So again, we see very strong suppression of the SPT6YW defect by the POP3 mutation. So we see very strong suppression, but how is it suppressing? We know that the defect for SPT6YW is a defect in the interaction of SPT6 and SPIN1. So we looked at that by CoIP and those results are shown on the next slide. Okay, this has many more lanes than I would ever let one of my students show in a talk, but I'm gonna focus down to just three of them. Again, we're looking at co-IP of SPT6 and SPIN1 and RPB1. So this first sample is one I showed you before, a wild type strain where SPT6 is IP'd and SPIN1 co-IPs at a high level. In the YW mutant, again, we see very low level of co-IP, and over here in the SPT6YW POB3 double mutant, again, we see a very low level of co-IP of SPT6 and SPIN1. So the POB3 suppressor, even though it strongly suppresses all those phenotypes, does not restore the SPT6-SPIN1 interaction. Olga also asked, well, what happens if we look at SPIN1 association with chromatin? So she did SPIN1 chip seek, and that's shown here. This is a metagene plot. Uh, if we look at wild type, you can see here's wild type metagene for SPIN1 chip seek. If we look in the SPT6YW mutant, we see that it's very low. And again, for the double mutant, also very low. So we learned from this experiment two things. First, recruitment of SPIN1 to chromatin is defective in SPT6YW, uh, meaning that SPT6 is required for that recruitment. But again, that defect is not suppressed by POB3. E154K. So somehow the cells are getting by without this association. Now remember I told you about uh, Francesca's mutant hunt where the, we look for suppressors that suppress the de a deletion of SPIN1. So I'm going to show you now a test where we ask does, SP, does the POB3 suppressor suppress a SPIN1 deletion? And that's shown here. So this is a yeast plasmid shuffle experiment. We're looking at three strains, wild type, a spin one deletion, and the double mutant. And we're looking on strains that either do or do not contain a plasmid with the wild type spin one gene. And when they have the wild type spin one gene, they all grow fine. When they don't have it, then we see that the inviability caused by spin one deletion shown here. However, again, the POB3 mutation very strongly suppresses the uh, growth defect, and these cells are fine and grow at a near normal rate. 
So now we can say that a change in fact, this third essential histone chaperone, bypasses the requirement for the essential spin one histone chaperone. How might that occur? Well, remember I told you that we had isolated a large number of mutations in SPT16 and POB3, the two components of FACT. So we look to see where those are, and that's shown on the next slide. So here are the domains of uh, SPT16 and POB3, as defined by studies from several labs, uh, shown down here. And the mutations are highly clustered. The suppressor mutations are highly clustered. If you see a number in red, that means independent isolates of the same mutation. So all of the SPT16 mutants are clustered in the SPT16 dimerization domain. It was defined as the dimerization domain. Most of the POP3 mutations, including our favorite one, which we found seven independent times, are clustered in the POP3 N-terminal dimerization domain. So they're highly clustered, but we thought that they probably did not affect dimerization. And so our analysis of this was really helped by the structure of human fact uh, with a nucleosome done by Carolyn Luger's lab, which she talked about in an earlier seminar in this series. I hope all of you heard it. And so we, uh, given the conservation between yeast and human, we we're able to place most of these mutations on altered amino acids on that structure. And that's shown here. So here's the structure. We, uh, the dark gray are histones. The gold color is nucleosomal DNA. Uh, green is SSRP1, that is human POB3. And uh, this color, whatever it is, blue, is human SPT16. All of the red balls are positions of our mutants, except for this yellow one, which is the POB3 mutation that I've been talking about. So we can see that these seem to cluster along the FACT nucleosome interface. And so we wanted to test what's the effect of this on interaction of POB3 and SPT16, but also on FACT with histones. And so that was done by co-immunoprecipitation. That result's shown on the next slide. And here's a co-IP that Olga did, where she IPs either wild type or mutant POB3, and then looks at co-immunoprecipitation of SPT16 or histone H3. And we see while there's very little effect on co-IP of SPT16, there's about a two-fold drop in the level of co-IP of histone H3. So from this, we conclude that the primary defect by this assay is decreased interactions with histone H3 and not in forming the FACT heterodimer. So uh, we also wanted to look at this by uh, chromatin IP. So in the final data slide, I'm going to show you some CHIP-seq experiments looking at the level of association of FACT with chromatin. Okay, so let me take you through this slide. Here we're actually doing CHIP-seq of SPT6 and SPT16 in different backgrounds, wild type and four mutant strains. And this is comparing what we see in the mutants to wild type. So the wild type is the line across the middle. So let's just look at the upper left panel. This is a scatter plot showing the effect of what the chip of SPT6YW protein, um, and this represents the level of wild type, wild type RNA levels. You can see that there is a slight reduced level of SPT6 in this mutant. Surprisingly, we saw that when we looked at chip of SPT16, the level is actually uh, greatly elevated compared to wild type level. So in this mutant, SPT6YW, there is an imbalance, an altered balance of SPT6 and FACT on chromatin. Going down to the bottom, now we see suppression of this effect. While the effect of SPT6 is about the same, we see that due to the POV3 mutation, which we believe uh, weakens interactions of FACT with chromatin, that we now see a reduced level, and now the balance of FACT and SPT6 on chromatin is, uh, re is suppressed and largely restored. So we think that this has something to do with the suppression, and in some ways, the level of SPT6 on chromatin or SPIN1 on chromatin affects the level of FACT on chromatin. So let me summarize this on the last slide. So we've been trying to figure out the relationship between these three histone chaperones. The SPT6 
his uh, spin one interaction is required from a lot of studies that I showed you and didn't have time to show you. Normal transcription and chromatin structure, genome stability, um, recruitment of spin one to chromatin, SPT6 is required for that, but also surprisingly, the level of fact uh, association with chromatin. Why does this happen? Why does the SPT6YW mutation cause an increased association of fact with chromatin? It could be due to loss of spin one, reduced level of SPT6, or altered chromatin structure. Uh, uh, one of my favorite recent papers by Ben Martin and Leanne Howe showed that, uh, provided evidence that fact likes to associate with altered chromatin. So if these mutations alter chromatin, then maybe it's a greater attraction for fact. But we think that that's an unhappy thing for the cells, and the suppressors want to correct that. So th uh, we believe that the relative levels of SPT6, in fact, that are associated with chromatin is critical. So why would it be so critical? We know from earlier genetic studies that um, SPT6, in fact, levels are very, very important. Overexpression or underexpression all cause mutant phenotypes. Both of these factors are very abundant, as shown by work from the Formosa lab. So it really sounds a lot like what we see for histones as well. So it makes us think that um, these histone chaperones regulate how well each one is associated with chromatin, and also that each one, in addition to their chaperone activities, are really important for the integrity of chromatin structure itself. So let me end by again acknowledging all the people that did this work. And thank you very much, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Fred. That was a beautiful, beautiful work and a very clear talk. Um, maybe I'll start off by asking for regarding the involvement of spin one and the increase in fact, since you did the spin one depletion by anchor away, could you look at early time points and see if that mimics um, the fact increase? Ah, that experiment is going on right now. So if, I'll give you Olga's email address and you can write her in a couple of weeks and find out what the, re what the answer is. So okay. we're doing exactly that experiment. Okay, very cool. Yeah. Um, okay, and there's a question in the chat from uh, KXU. He says, hello, great talk, thanks. I have a question. Does the SPTYW affect H3 recycling during transcription? Does this mutant have any effect on CPT or other drugs instead of DNA damage reagent? Um, we don't know if it has effects with other drugs, and we have not yet looked at histone recycling. So the answer is we don't know. Um, then uh, I see another question in the chat from Yunus Ahmadbaz, and he asks, have you looked for nucleosome occupancy in case of spin one mutants? But I guess that's... Uh, my... Yes, so I didn't have time to talk about it, but Olga looked, did MNA seek uh, looking at a spin one mutant that was identified in the Stargell lab K192N, which is a TS mutant. And when she looked at that, we saw an MNA pattern that is identical to what we see in SPT6YW, with a uh, greater distance between nucleosomes. So they look the same as each other. Okay, then we have another question from Craig Peterson. Hi, Craig. Craig, good to see you again. Long time no long, see. Long time no see, I would say. A great talk, Fred. So I had just a, kind of like a very specific question for you, Fred. I was struck by that MNA seq pattern where you saw the change in spacing between nukes on the YW, but uh -huh. Perhaps more striking than the change in spacing was the shift in the plus one also to the right. And typically, you know, things that affect eye switch and chud, you know, will affect spacing, but they typically don't affect the position of the plus one, which is usually sensing more the, you know, upstream boundaries and things. It looked a lot like an Eno80 depletion or Eno80 mutant, uh, which, is one, which is one of the few mutants that actually changes the position of the plus one by about two, two nucleotides. Yeah, we haven't looked at Eno80. That's a that's a good point. We haven't looked at Eno80. We probably should. It's a wacky observation from left field for you. So, yeah, thank you. Um, <laughs> but that a similarity was pretty remarkable. That that okay. you know, the plus one movement is very uh, rare. All right, I'm writing that down. <laughs> but great seeing you again, Fred. Likewise. Um, then another question in the chat from Gilad Yakov. 
Um, and he thanks you for the great talk and says, have you been able to look at the chromatin mark landscape in these mutants? Is it altered? I'm sorry, can you say it again? Uh, whether you've looked at chromatin modifications, I think chromatin mark landscape is what Gilad says, whether that is altered. Um, chromatin marks in, in what? Um, yeah, so in the mutants, he says, have you been able to look at the chromatin mark oh. landscape in these mutants? Uh, we, oh, I see, yes. Um, well, as I mentioned, in spin one depletion alone, we see a shift in chromatin marks. In SPT6 depletion, we see a loss of K36 dye and trimethylation. We have not yet looked at chromatin marks in the suppressed conditions that I've that I talked about today with the POP3 suppressor to ask if that affects chromatin marks. Uh, Francesca in the lab has started to look at that a little bit with other suppressors, but the final word on that isn't in yet, but it's definitely something of interest. I think we'll wrap up with a question from Peter Sarkis. Um, how often does transcribing pull 2 engage chromatin without FACT or SPT6 when it initiates as a, at a specific gene 100% or does it sometimes try without? Might this change in your YW mutant? I'm sorry, can you read that one more time? <laughs> sure. You can also open it up in the Q&A if you'd like okay. to read it yourself. Um, but he asked whether, basically whether the pull 2 ever initiates or starts transcribing without factor SPT6. Oh, yes. Um, so initiation, um, we don't think requires SPT6. When we see a reduced level of initiation, we think it is likely occurring because SPT6 allows activation of so many intragenic promoters that it is diluting out uh, factors that form the pre-initiation complex. So we're basically doubling the level of promoters without increasing the level of factors. So while there are some promoters, like uh, FO5 that Jessica Tyler's lab studied and uh, CHA1 that we studied, that where SPT6 does seem to play a direct role, we think of most promoters it's actually not having a direct role. Yeah, and I'll add one more because I saw a question from Toshi coming in. Um, okay. He says, uh, given that mutations in so many factors involved in chromatin reorganization rescue SPT6 and SPIN1 mutants, do you think mutations in spin, uh, SPT6 spin 1, like the interaction, I guess, causes um, overcorrection of chromatin structure in transcribed regions? Overcorrection. I can also unmute you, Toshi, if you want to. Yeah, good. <laughs> okay, I'll allow him to talk. I don't know if he's going to use that. Okay. <laughs> Hi. Hi, Hi, Fred. Toby. Great to see you. Um, okay. So what I meant was, um, you know, the CHD1 and the other uh, mu mutations that known to rescue those um, SPT6 and SP1 mutants, they're all known to um, reorganize chromatin in the transcribed regions. Yeah. And all of those seem to rescue SPT6 and SP1. So I was wondering, if, if you mutate spin one and SPT6, uh, something happens to the transcribed regions that <clears throat> normally used to uh, rescue chromatin structure after transcription that works too well. That's why yeah. you reduce function of those factors, uh, you can rescue the phenotypes. Um, we actually haven't thought about it that way. So maybe we should start to think about it that way. I will add, we have pretty good evidence that rescue occurs by more than one mechanism. Mm. And that comes from Francesca's work that I haven't had time to describe, where we know that in some cases rescue is dependent on histone acetylation, and in other mm. cases it's not. I see. So I don't think any one mechanism is going to explain it all. It also raises the issue of why are these factors essential if the inviability can be overcome by multiple ways. Are they essential because they do a lot of things? And if you if you fix just a subset, does that overcome the inviability or what's going on? Or are they all related in some way? But um, overcorrection is something that hasn't been our in our um, lab jargon. Maybe we'll put it in and start to think about it more. Great, thank you. Thank you, Toshi. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, um, Fred, and thank you, uh, Maggie, as well, and all the audience for asking great questions.